Hi, this video is about medieval food and feast. I bet you see them differently. Stay tuned. Before we start, many thanks to my patron Holy Father. Thanks a lot. Ok, let's start. In the beginning I want to give you a little puzzle. Here you can see several miniatures from a medieval chronicles depicting medieval feasts. For example, this meeting of John Gaunt and King of Portugal. And this of Richard III. Oh, some of these as well. So, what is strange in all of these pictures? The answer I will discuss a bit further, but I hope you would appreciate the opportunity to solve the puzzle for yourself. If you do, please do not hesitate to make a comment. There is plenty information regarding medieval feasts and cooking. Their large collection of recipes appeared only in the late 14th-15th centuries. The one author that gives us a lot of information about food and feast is Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer describes them through his, most probably, fictional companions, Wife of Beth, Griselda and others. The most strict rules of food were of course adopted by the church. Until the early 15th century all healthy adults had been forbidden for four-footed flesh meat on three days a week and other fasting period on one or more nights and days. However, restrictions become more and more lax. So, by 15th century, in lay society and most of the monasteries, on Friday remained restriction fasting days or fisher days. Though to some people and monasteries Wednesday and Saturdays, as well as rogation days and Advent, were still limited to the food one can eat. Even stricter rules applied to land, which was six weeks, as it is now. Well, not only meat was forbidden, but eggs dairy food as well. But even at these times, Abbot could at any time accept the food that any landowner or courtier could present to him, most usually acquired in hunting. Some of the recipes cooks of the time created were very unusual indeed. The mock of a hard-boiled egg made out of almond paste dipped into brown shells to be eaten in land. But the rules on food, especially for land, severely damaged the population of some animals. For example, boasters, large swift running birds and beavers were mostly instinct in Europe. Not only for their taste, but also as beavers used their tails for swimming, they considered to be fish during then. The Bouquet of Nurture, written by John Russell, dedicated to children upbringing, describes the service of children at the dining table. In the book, we can see the lads do the task of senior domestic officer at a formal dinner, from cutting bread, which were used as plate, to table laying and the care of wine and polishing utensils. They were taught about nutrition and courtly carving, as well as handling with soaps and sauces. They were also taught with personal hygiene. Such a bringing was applied to every child in the household. Some children of lesser degree could use the knowledge in their future service, while others would use it for carrying meat on a hunt or for service to their parents. These lads also used this knowledge to direct and control their own stuff and know the etiquette and control the service when hosting. One or two might even be called to act as a butler, server or marshal in formal capacity at royal or episcopal feast, which, should I say, was a great honor. Knights, squires and pars who ranked in henchmen at the court, whether the kings or senior noblemen, were usually fed by court's commissariat. The day schedule for a young man was following. On awakening, he would wash and dress, go to the chapel to hear at least part of the mass. Once blessed, he would drink a mug of ale with bread or toast and go for his task for the day. If his lord was going for hunting, servants would load cards with tables, cautions, baskets and bag of food and forward to a special dining place in the forest. And if he were to dine at home, they make tables, lay tablecloth, place dresser set with jugs and wine cups, bread boards and serving tools. Type and quantity of food, of course, depended mostly whether it was ordinary day, fishy day or a feast. Before the meal, everybody washed their hands and sit at the table to hear the grace said. Youngsters at the table cut and pass bread to everyone. As we already discussed, it was used as a plate. Servers place large bowls, one between two or four people for soap and other wet food, and platters of roast meat and slices of pie. Before the Lord, they placed the pile of trenchers, and when he took a pitch of salt from a, from a ceremonial salt cellar, the meal could begin. Even in large households, the menu was not very large. The Lord might have a choice of six dishes in the first course, while his senior staffs usually four. Middle-ranking officers got only three and juniors two. 
everyone could have ale or water wine. Although grandees alone were given the wine jar and the water pitcher, so they could use wine as strong as they liked. After the first course, tablecloth had been changed and the top ranking nobles got the second course. The boys at the bottom end might get hunk of cheese or an apple to chew while they waited for the superiors. After noble finished their meal, everybody was served with lighter dishes and pastries with sweet wine and sugared any seeds. Strictly speaking, just an informal snack meal was supposed to be served in the evening and supper, as it was more relaxed. The lord and his family or friends usually retired soon afterwards to private conversation with the minstrels or storyteller to entertain them. And the staff might have one too, or an amusing conjurer or card trickster before they go to bed. Sometimes, if the stories were good, they managed to prolong the evening with a late night snack, which was disapproved by the authority, but soothing the wine filled young stomachs. So, let's talk about this now. The preparations for a special feast started early. By noon, the display shelves of the cupboards covered with gold and pewter. The best damask cloth lay smoothly over the high table with a senate, overlay protecting the tablecloth on top and the matching towels over the service ready folded. Ewers, bowls, essay tools and the best ceremonial salt cellar were polished. Behind and above a large chair were placed to his cloth of a state. Minstrels announced the meal and the usual preliminaries were followed by the ceremonies of a say. With ritual etiquette, every dish or drink the lord consumed was touched or tasted first by a servant in case it was poisoned. The proceedings was more ceremonial rather than real value, but it gave the servers time to sort out the seating plan to fit the both guests and members of the household. When the whole royal court assembled for a major feast, every possible dining space had to be used, even barns and diaries and the complications of precedence were almost inseparable despite there being several sittings. But even a modest feast for a provincial lord or abbot might mean feeding more than a hundred people of various different grades, and even on a flesh days parallel fish dishes had to be supplied for any particularly pious cleric or penitent layman. It was perhaps just as well as the lord's service consisted of a dozen or more dishes, probably served one by one. It was unacceptable if lower in social skill person had been given so much choice. Elm's basket were placed on the table into which the leftovers and the help in the feasting diners were put. After the meal the almoners staff took them to the waiting out walkers and beggars at the gate. The steward was not allowed to economize by cutting down supplies, which would probably not be eaten because some diner was fasting. It could be strange, but the food, although more colorful and varied than usual, was not the outstanding feature of the feast. A celebratory showpiece called a sapleti, usually a sculptured sugar or pastry model, was paraded and presented to the top table at the end of each course. Sometimes there were favors or mementos for the lower tables too. The main sapleti could be very grand indeed made in several tiers, each with wax or plaster models in a typical on other setting easily identified by the diners. The crucial distinctive aspect of any feast was entertainment. Sometimes at a royal feast noble peer present royal gifts in public between courses on his master's behalf. A more common display was a playlet like a Venus sketch called the interlude, which was played while the clothes were changed for the next course. Alternatively, after the dinner a portable stage or scenery might be wheeled into the main hall and the play or a silent mumming show would then be performed either by the Lord's own trooper or by traveling players. Most great men keep the band of musicians and other acrobats and mummers to entertain guests and swap them temporarily for those of other magnates when bored. At a small feast, audience participation might be used to prevent boredom by making guests themselves sing or play the lute for the company, or everyone might dance, a favorite pastime of Richard II, which let him show off his fine embroidered clothes. Even clerics in monasteries said to follow supper with singing, lute playing and dancing with nuns. A favorite pawn when even dancing and singing carols, round dance and song routine, failed was to introduce these geysers to add the surprise to entertainment. Suddenly, without warning, strangers entered the room in fantastical costumes and headgear and masks. They joined the dancing or performed some act or dance on their own in total silence, and then withdrew, leaving the company to guess what they represent and who they might be. This was, as a rule, not very difficult since they usually were members of a host household, but the types of disguise and the mask were probably quite well kept secret until the night. Disguising was the entertainment in actions, which corresponded most closely to the visual spectacle 
and surprise offered by the subtly in the making of a really first-class piece. To lift their spirit, most medieval people drank well. Ale was a common drink at every meal, cloudy or bright depending on how long it had stood and on one's purse. The older and clearer it was, the more it cost. They should be compounded with herbs as German made it, which is how hops came to Britain, or honeyed, or spiced and called brago, which of course cost more. Wine was imported too, but unlike today's standards, the newer wine was the better wine. Usually it was drunk watered, and the mark of honor was to be given the wine and water bottles to mix your own. The feast it was a common place to drink too much. Whether at a humble parish affair or on a grand state occasion, the most of a company would have little else to do while nobles finish their deserts. From Christmas to Twelfth Night was always the time of a roistering drunkness, and that was understandable. Yet Lent was Bubilus time too, and that could only be explained by rigor of six weeks salt fish diet. So that's it for a story. Now let's take a look at the pictures from the start. I don't know, have you guessed, but people on the feast do not eat. Usually there is not so many pictures depicting eating people. For example here, depicting Last Supper and the only one eating is Judas. It is called betrayal by food, as Jesus said, the one eating with me will betray me. Also eating was associated with gluttony, one of the seven sins. So no nobles were depicted eating. We can see only low class and specifically sinners. And the last part, which I find very curious, hope you will do. And it is for ones who want to taste real medieval meat. I made it myself, it is very simple and unexpectedly delicious. It is speed roasted or grilled steak from 215th century cookery book by Hardline. The original recipe looks like this. I'm sorry I wouldn't have you even move my even worse old English, so... You need to take verjuice. A rather popular medieval ingredient made out of unripe grapes. It can usually be substituted with civil orange juice. The sour, the better. A wine vinegar, a red wine, I took Pinot Noir. Why? Well, it is a rule of thumb to use in cooking the wine you usually would drink alone. Some ginger, I used dry one, although I like fresh, but I doubt even nobleman had one. And cinnamon. So we mix together 4 tablespoons of wine, 2 tablespoons of vinegar and 2 tablespoons of verjuice. Add a pinch of ginger and cinnamon. You can adjust proportions if you like. Grill or roast your stickies like you usually do, but sprinkle it while cooking. And serve a steak sprinkled with the mix as well. I really recommend it, it's easy and delicious. That's it for today, hope you like it. Like it if you do, subscribe if you don't want to miss more. Thank you much. Bye-bye.